case and what is about the Tharal's case, hip case? Ah, that's what I'm, I'm going to add it now. If Tharal is not joining. Is it a hip case or is it something else? I think he told me it was a hip case. Okay. Because that's all it. my cases are feet. I've okay. got uh, five different uh, foot deformities in club foot, in uh, Spina Bifida. So okay. we'll be going live on uh, YouTube now. Okay. Because through that, <laughs> it's not public, but through that we'll uh, post it on the site. Sure. So my my presentation uh, has a few cases. So if you want, we can pull them up at the end. Like, I think I, okay, have, I have some knee, some pictures of knee, spine. Uh, it's almost okay. all the deformities I have. So we can pull them up. Calcaneous foot. Is sure. Like, When are you starting, Ashok? In a minute. Okay. So, Mohan, how's the things in Phoenix with COVID? <laughs> well, I think as of the, the latest count, US is number one, number of cases wise. Yeah, yeah. So, I, th I think we have almost 100,000 cases and then yeah. the number of deaths <laughs> has crashed 7,000. 7,000, yeah. Bad. Unfortunately, yeah, mostly on the east coast. Yes, it's all all the states are affected, but yeah. most of the deaths are on the northeast coast yeah. and then yeah. California, those you know, Michigan, those kind of areas. Fortunately, our area is not bad. We have only had seven deaths till till today. Okay. So, but we are all in lockdown last two weeks till extending extended mm -hmm. till thirtieth of April. Oh, okay. So, the, but that's but, been. Uh, Done by your governor, no? No, no. Well, lockdown. This is federal government has 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 made some guidelines, and then the governor okay. also. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we are still doing like we like we talked about like emergency stuff, and then some semi-elective stuff if if it's time sensitive. Okay. Most of the clinics we are doing Zoom or telemedicine or telephone. Some okay. some inpatient. So some. Outpatient, some clinic visits as well, if like post op patients and things like that. Right. The migrant workers probably, mm -hmm. for, I'm mm -hmm. reading, are having a hard time. Mm -hmm. Day to day workers. Yeah, today morning, Singapore has enforced a lockdown for one month again. There's yeah. There. I think even in Hong Kong and things, there's restarting. Yeah. Hard. I think the Indian government has done a very good job till now. Yeah, so far. They're just waiting for the next bad <laughs> thing to happen. Yeah, <laughs> I just hope that they shut down all uh, for the next five years. What? Yeah. For the next five years? Shut down all temples, masjids, and religious yeah. and all stupid congregations. Ashok, whenever you're ready, we'll start. I think he's muted his phone. His, uh, Do you want me to share my screen again? <clears throat> or not yet? Yes, I think that's a good idea. But um, Ashok has to, the host has to enable everything. Yeah, you are, we are there now. Ah, oh, great. So we can see. Ashok, can we start? Mohan, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. But... Okay. So you are a um, professor of uh, pediatric orthopedics now, or associate? Associate, or... associate professor. Associate. You're associate, okay. So, so I work at Phoenix Children's Hospital. You can see the sign on the right-hand side, the screen, yeah. and then left-hand side is the University. We are actually attached to three universities. One is University of Arizona, and then Mayo Medical School, and then uh, 
Creighton University, but uh, main main link is yeah. University of Arizona College of yeah. Medicine. No, University of Arizona is actually a very uh, a famous university, isn't it? It's uh, it's got a lot of Nobel laureates and that and this. The the in basic sciences. Yeah, maybe, but 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 I but I don't think it's the University of Arizona has two places. One is in Tucson, which is southwest of Phoenix. That's uh -huh. been the older university. The newer uh -huh. Phoenix one is just about six, seven years old. So okay. the one in Phoenix was not there before. It's been there for seven years now. So it's, a, but it's an up and growing university. Yeah. So university yeah. Tucson, like UCLA, like University of California has many places. Los Angeles, Davis, San Diego, and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So University of Arizona also has two places, Tucson and Phoenix. Yeah. I don't know what happened to Ashok. We can start, sir. We can start? OK. So good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Jayan Sampath. And welcome to the webinar on spina bifida. We are very lucky to have Dr. Mohan Beltur, who works at uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital. He is a pediatric orthopedic surgeon with a special interest in the management of neuromuscular problems. Um, he has a gait lab, um, does cerebral palsy, and um, neuromuscular problems like spina bifida. He's actually a son of Bangalore, uh, did his MS auth from KEM, spent many years in the UK, and then moved to the US. So uh, he has very widespread experience across three continents about how to manage problems. So <clears throat> he's also a good friend. So welcome Mohan um, for this webinar and um, I think we can start uh, the presentation. So over to Mohan. So thank you for your kind words. Good morning to all in India, hopefully, you're staying safe. Uh, you're staying safe in, during this uh, COVID pandemic. So I'll get started with today's webinar. Um, so, so my charge is to talk about spina bifida principles of management. So these are my learning objectives. So we'll we'll talk about um, what neural tube defects are, and then try to understand the terminology a little bit. And then we'll, we'll talk about one classification system that we use in our multidisciplinary spina bifida clinic here. We then, we look at the epidemiology, uh, etiology and pathogenesis and consequences of an open neural tube defect. So uh, we will be mainly be talking about open neural tube defects, especially open spin up, Bifida, which is the commonest of the uh, neural tube defects. Thereafter, we'll talk about which body systems it affects and what morbidities they can cause. And then we'll understand what are the orthopedic issues and then review some clinical evaluation tools of what we do when the child presents to our clinic. And finally, we'll discuss some principles of management um, So neural tube defects um, are, are fairly common. The incidence is about one in thousand live births. They result from failure of closure of the neural tube during embryogenesis. Um, and as you can see, I just want to talk a little bit about the embryology. The neural tube develops from a special, from a few special cells on the dorsal part of the embryo during the fourth week, especially the 22nd to 24th days. A part of the ectoderm overlying the notochord, as you can see on the left hand side of your picture here, where my cursor is pointing, develops into the neural plate. And then this invaginates and becomes the new rectoderm and also forms the neural tube. Um, the, 
the mesoderm. So the embryo is a three lump, is a three layered uh, embryo at this point, consisting of the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. The mesoderm surrounding the notochord and the neural canal becomes the paraxial mesoderm and forms the somites. And as you can see, as the neural tube starts starts closing from the cranial to the cardioid end as it progresses. And then finally, you have a cranial neuropore and a caudal neuropore and they close. So, so initially, that, so this process is called primary neurulation and neural tube defects result from failure of this neural tube to close on the dorsal side of the embryo. And therefore, um, an open neural tube defect results. So on the other category of neural tube defects is called closed neural tube defects. They result from once it's closed, that means the neural tube is not communicating with the, with the outside. It fails to separate from the surrounding structures. So that's called, that results in closed neural tube defects. In brief, um, if you want to look at the, the classification system, so spinal dysraphism, dysraphism means failure of the central part of the neural tube to close and in the spine, and they can be divided into open and closed neural tube defects, essentially. Open neural tube defects are more common and constitute about 80% of all neural tube defects. Closed neural tube defects constitute about 20%. For some examples of open neural tube defects could be like a myelocele, where just the meninges are communicating with the exterior. And then myelomeningocele where, um, sorry, the, both the meninges and some spinal cord contents are communicating. Um, that's at the lower end of the spinal cord. At the upper end, it could be an anent cephaly where you know the dorsal part of the skull is not closed and then the brain contents or the, and the, you know, meninges lining the brain matter may be communicating with the exterior. Some examples of closed neural tube defects could be, the closed neural tube defects in turn can be divided into those with a, associated with a subcutaneous mass, for example, a lipomeningocele, or those without a mass, for example, um, a, a tethered cord or a dermal sinus, etc. This picture shows some examples. So starting from the left-hand side, there's something called as craniorachyschisis. That means the whole, the, the brain as well as the spinal cord, the whole of it is communicating with the exterior. So this is the most severe form of an open neural tube defect. Usually results in death very early on in life. Next picture shows anencephaly, which is the neural tube fails to close around the cranial neuropore and communicates with the exterior. This again is not usually compatible with life for long. Um, other open neural tube defects could be, if you come to the bottom right-hand side of the slide, you can see a meningocele where the meninges are pouting out. Um, this is a, in this picture, this is a closed defect because the skin is intact. If the skin and everything is open, then it will become an open neural tube defect. Um, and then here on the left-hand side of the picture, this is a, um, a closed neural tube defect with a, with a mass. So this is a lipo meningocele, okay? And other example would be a spina bifida occulta where there is just the, um, the, the posterior aspect of the spinal, the vertebral of the canal, posterior elements, they don't fuse. Uh, this is seen in about five to 10% of the general population. Sometimes <coughs> it's an incidental finding. Like I said earlier, my talk is mostly going to concentrate on the open neural tube defects, and in particular, on open um, spina bifida or myelomeningocele, because that's the most common open neural tube defect. And it's also the most disabling birth defect, resulting in permanent disability, but it's compatible with survival. Um, the incidence of all neural tube defects, like I said, was one in thousand, but if you look at just myelomeningocele, you know, the prevalence, overall prevalence is about, you know, half of that, maybe about 0.5 per thousand or four to five 
per 10,000 cases um, in, in the United States. In, in China, I think some statistics are available. It's higher. Um, so in some of the developing countries, it could be higher, okay? The incidence, however, has been decreasing over the last few decades. And we will come to that in the next few slides and we'll discuss why that is due to. Now, why is it important to learn about it? It's because it can, it can cause, it can result in significant economic burden because it's compatible with survival but um, may result in significant consequences because of the involvement of the, the neural elements like the motor, sensory, and the autonomic nervous system. And it's estimated that one child with spina bifida can, the lifetime cost for taking care of the child is about half a million dollars or more. So that's the economic burden on the society. Also, if you look at the epidemiology and compare it to other disorders, we usually see in pediatric orthopedics. For example, the, the, the prevalence of club foot is about one per thousand or one to two per thousand um, in the United States and in the developed countries, it could be higher. Uh, but if you compare that relatively with cerebral palsy, it's about three per thousand uh, and has been fairly constant. If you look at open spina bifida, the, the prevalence is about you know, 0.5 per thousand. So this slide shows that. Now, like I said, if you look at the, you know, the number of cases and follow it forward since the 1990s over the last two to three decades, uh, the trend has been, has been, has seen there has been a decreasing prevalence. And this is mainly because of the introduction of folic acid in, uh, in the antenatal care of, uh, of pregnant mothers in 1996 uh, and later. And also because of better diagnosis in the antenatal period and medical termination of pregnancy. So if you look at what, what is the cause for neural tube defects, um, the cause is multifactorial in about 95% of cases. The genetic causes are thought to contribute about 60 to 70% or approximately two thirds and non-genetic causes, meaning environmental causes could the remaining third. In the genetic causes, there are two main important genes that people have worked on on mice models. One is called the planar cell polarity genes. These control the closure of the neural tube. Um, so if they are not working properly, the neural tube doesn't close. And the secondly, it's called as the folate one carbon metabolism genes. These control folic acid metabolism and therefore can contribute um, to inadequate folic acid, which is necessary for um, uh, the activities of the cell. Um, the non-genetic or environmental causes um, could be direct folic acid deficiency in the diet and also maternal anti-convulsant anti treatment or maternal diabetes or obesity, infection, et cetera. Um, now, if you look at what has reduced the prevalence of spina bifida, the first thing is introduction of folic acid as a supplement in the 1990s. The federal drug agency introduced compulsory or mandatory folic acid supplementation in 1996. And there is randomized control evidence to show that this has significantly reduced the incidence, okay? Other thing that has helped is vitamin B supplements, especially B12, and also good antenatal care of the pregnant mother, and especially um, um, fetal ultrasound and MRI. So let's look at folic acid, for example, that has reduced the prevalence by almost 50 to 70%. And you, usually the recommendation is 400 micrograms per day, usually because the neural tube closure, uh, because neural, the neurulation is happening in the, between the fourth and ninth week, even before the mother knows that she's pregnant, this has happened. So usually they recommend if the mother is even thinking about having a child or even all 
children, or, or all women of childbearing age should be having folic acid. So how much? Usually the recommended dose is about 400 micrograms every day, ideally starting several months before conception. But if the, if the mother has already given birth to a child with a neural tube defect, the risk is higher. Therefore, the CDC, that is the Center for Disease Control, recommends a 10 times higher dose, 4,000 micrograms per day. Now, let's look at how spina bifida is diagnosed. Usually, the, the maternal blood sample is taken and the serum alpha fetoprotein is measured at 15 to 20 weeks. And that usually will be increased if the child has an open neural tube defect. But this is not a confirmatory test because there could be other reasons why the alpha fetoprotein could be elevated. Therefore, nowadays, the confirmatory test would be either a fetal ultrasound, a 3D or even 4D, as shown on the right-hand side of my slide here, you can see the arrow pointing to the neural tube defect with a myelomeningocele, seal. And then a fetal MRI, here it's showing a, a sacral neural tube defect. The arrow is showing a sacral neural tube defect. As you can see, the child's head is pointing down. Um, and then the neural tube defect, you can see the arrow here. So these things can be pretty uh, or very well advanced and can inform the the perinatologist is caring for the mother and they can make a decision about medical termination of pregnancy. Uh, now, that's about prevention. Let's talk about the consequences of having an open neural tube defect. It usually results because it affects myelomeni um, an open myelomeningocele affects the neural elements below the level of the lesion. It, it results in motor deficit or paralysis, sensory paralysis, as well as involvement of the bladder and bowel, resulting in a neurogenic bowel and bladder. Also, it's associated with a lot of other spinal cord lesions. For example, Chiari malformation is present in about 90% and maybe severe in 30% of children with a neural tube defect. This can also cause hydrocephalus, which can further affect neural development. Other things could be a syrinx, which is an enlargement of the central canal of the spinal cord. Uh, other things could be a diastematomalia, which is a, a split spinal cord, a tethered cord, etc. Also in terms of orthopedic issues, um, some birth defects may be present from birth, for example, failure of formation or segmentation of the spinal elements can result in spinal deformities. You can also have birth defects like club feet um, or other birth defects. Uh, these sometimes can also be secondary, can be acquired because of muscle imbalance. So when you have paralysis below the level of the lesion, that can result in a neurogenic club foot, for example, or other deformities like scoliosis or et cetera, or hip dysplasia, for example. Also, another cause of orthopedic deformities could be like hydrogenic. For example, when surgery, neurosurgery is done to close the neural tube defect early on, early on um, during the child's life, that can result in a tethered cord syndrome. And that can result in orthopedic deformities as well. So it's important to identify what is causing the deformities and what are the consequences of having a neural tube defect? And these are permanent, okay? So, and, and these can be sometimes devastating, okay? So now let's look at what systems can be affected by an open neural tube defect. So it's a multi-system disorder and I'll tell you why. Because if you start from the neurosurgical aspects, we already talked about all the associated lesions, and these can significantly impact uh, the outcome, both for survival as well as uh, function. And then we talked about the orthopedic deformities, usually affects the lower extremities on the spine. The upper extremities are usually spared unless there is a syrinx or hydrocephalus or a Chiari malformation, which can then also affect the upper extremity sometimes. Like we talked about, 
the genital urinary system can be affected, especially the urinary system. Um, it can result in a neurogenic bladder. Sometimes it can result in an atonic small capacity spastic bladder, or it can result in a large capacity flaccid paralysis of the bladder. Both of these conditions can result in um, incontinence as well as repeated urinary tract infection, vesicouterine reflux, and upper urinary tract affection and nephropathy. And this is one of the main causes of death as we come and uh, as we look at it later. The genital urinary system, they can have incontinence or constipation, chronic constipation. Also, uh, in, they can have a lot of these children because they cannot walk like a typically developing child. They develop obesity as they become older. That can be a significant problem. We talked about sensation because this, they don't have protective sensation and they have deformities in their feet. These can result in decubitus ulcers and these can get infected and result in osteomyelitis, et cetera. And last but not least, there they can be significant psychosocial issues. For example, depression, learning disabilities, and this can affect how they function in adulthood and in adolescence and can result in lower levels of education and employment. So therefore it's a multi-system disorder, not just an orthopedic condition. So we therefore um, need a team, but let's look at survival. So this was a study from UK, which looked at uh, a long-term outcomes of, of 117 children who had open spina bifida, which was closed within the first few days of birth and they followed them for 40 years. And it showed that the main, uh, the mortality was significantly increased compared to a typically developing population uh, of normal children. Uh, and then the mortality was about, if the lesion was above, L1 or, for example, in the thoracic area, the mortality was very high. And it was about, if it was, if it was about T11, the mortality was about 17% at 40 years, or only 17% lived, the rest of them died. And then if it was a lesion below L3, the mortality was, was about you know 40%, means 60% lived at the age of 40 years. The main causes of death, were cardiorespiratory, neurologic, or urologic, secondary to involvement of the renal system. And this, the urologic deaths were mostly observed in the high lumbar or the thoracic level open myelomeningocytes. So this is important. So you can predict based on the neurologic level what their survival is going to be in future. Now, how do we manage this condition? Like I said, it's a multi-system condition with significant comorbidities involving multiple body systems. So therefore it needs a, a multidisciplinary team or a village to take care of this child. Usually in our multidisciplinary, the clinic, we have neurosurgery, urology, GI, pediatrics, orthopedics, physical medicine, rehab, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and a social worker. It's been shown over the last two decades that a team approach provides better outcomes for these children. Now, the first step would be once a diagnosis has been made and the family decides to continue with the pregnancy, um, the, the neural tube defect needs to be closed either prenatally before birth or immediately after birth within 48 hours. So following that, I'm just going to give you an overview of the multiple system management and then I'll switch over to orthopedics. For example, we talked about the neurogenic bladder and bladder that requires usually early self early clean intermittent catheterization initially by the parents and later on by the child themselves as they grow older and can do it themselves. This is to prevent or this is to achieve urinary continence and prevent upper urinary tract injury. 
this is started early pretty much in infancy and usually done once in 3 to 4 hours for the gastrointestinal system the aim is to achieve bowel continence so they can live in society and also prevent constipation so they are on a bowel regimen in terms of the skin it's like a diabetic foot they need to be very cognizant and take care of their feet main aim is to prevent decubitus ulcers and also prevent and treat foot deformities orthopedics is necessary to aim is to provide effective mobility not necessarily ambulation so main focus is on improving function it could be ambulation but that's not the primary goal goal is effective mobility that means getting from point a to point b sometimes maybe with a wheelchair not necessarily ambulation okay depends on the neurologic level in pediatrics usually they are needed for care coordination between the various specialty providers and to prevent medical complications psychology is needed for the mental and emotional health like we talked about physical therapy and occupational therapy to optimize functional potential by providing you know um, uh, by working with the family and the child optimizing the child's muscle power etc and gait training etc orthotics are needed i didn't put, put that up there orthotics are needed for appropriate bracing and prevention of deformities social workers are needed for care coordination now coming back to the surgical intervention like i said the first thing to do is closure of the open neural tube defect and this should be achieved before 48 hours because it can result in infection there is a new guideline from the pediatric neurosurgical society which came out in 2019 and this is based on systematic reviews and current evidence um nowadays in some selected centers they are doing prenatal closure of the neural tube defect and i'll talk about that in a minute after the neural tube is closed many of the children may have hydro hydrocephalus and they may need a vent a vp shunt or some kind of shunt a ventricular peritoneal shunt to divert divert the csf fluid and decrease pressure on the the contents of the brain then they require treatment for orthopedic problems which we'll talk about in detail and that they could be foot deformities are most common then spine hip transverse plane deformities and fractures and obviously they may require surgery for bowel and bladder if the medical treatment fails as i talked about earlier in terms of appendicosecostomy or vesicostomy or bladder augmentation etc so so let's talk a little bit about prenatal surgeries uh, i'm sure the patients may ask me i'm not sure if this is available in india but since in 2011 mom stands for um, um myelomeningocele um, surgery done prenatally to close the neural tube defect okay and they conducted a randomized controlled trial uh, of prenatal closure versus postnatal closure in 2011 the results showed that when they had prenatal closure usually done around 24 to 28 weeks um, this decreases the need for a vp shunt postnatally and improved motor outcomes in the short term when i mean short term at about 30 months so they don't have a long term follow up yet so they are currently continuing with a long term follow up so those are the benefits so it improves motor outcomes that means ambulatory outcomes at short term and decreases the need for vp shunt but at the same time there are fetal and maternal risks because when you do the fetal surgery you have to cut open the uterus that can cause uterine rupture or premature rupture of membranes etc and also there are certain risks for the fetus and the baby can die so it's a matter of weighing the risks and benefits so currently it's just approved in a few centers i think about 7 to 8 centers in the united states so these are some of the results of, of the randomized controlled trial which clearly show decreased need for vp shunts at one year of age and better ambulatory outcomes 
but some co complications in the in the mother like uterine dehiscence etc so so currently they are working on the endoscopic methods this may be used in the future in instead of cutting open the uterus they are trying to do the smaller incisions laparoscopic surgery now let's focus on the orthopedic treatment or the management there have been a lot of advances over the last three decades and we've learned a lot from our mistakes initially the focus was, was more on radiographs rather than on function but more recently we've been focusing more on function which is what is important gait analysis 3d gait analysis has allowed us to really understand the pathology and its consequences and help us to avoid making the mistakes that we were doing before and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, the other principles of orthopedic management are to correct deformities to optimize function and improve improve ambulation um, and also improve sitting balance or maintain spine balance so those are the principles of orthopedic management now how do we evaluate a child when it comes first to our clinic well after getting a detailed history and uh, we start with an evaluation of the neurologic level we do that by evaluating sensory and motor function the motor function is evaluated using the manual muscle testing method of kendall and kendall this has been validated it can be done very well even in a child about 1 year of age um, that's been shown from chicago earlier we thought only when the child was about 5 to 6 we could predictly predictably uh, evaluate the neurologic level but nowadays even a child about 1 year of age we can do it predictably we can't use the mrc grading but at least we can measure anti gravity function so the lowest functional level the motor level is wherever whichever muscle has grade 3 or more function or anti gravity function the lowest level that, that's the that's the that's the functional level um, and then the sensory level is also very important and an important predictor and i'll come to that in my next slide we also then evaluate the spine lower extremity and and the upper extremities for any deformities we evaluate the skin and also we look at the child's function in terms of mobility and activities of living and evaluate their orthotic needs uh, like i said again as study from uk patient for 40 years showed that if you evaluate perineal sensation uh, it's an important predictor of long term outcome so this table shows you that in in those children who had perineal sensation that means sensation in s2 3 and 4 dermatomes at least on one side as compared to those children who did not have any sensation they had better survival in terms of deaths or decreased mortality in the long term so no urologic deaths in those who had perineal sensation as opposed to 20% urologic deaths in those who did not have perineal sensation they had better continence both fecal and bowel they walked better and they were less likely to have pressure sores in the long term so just by evaluating the perineal sensation early on you can predict these outcomes so it's an important outcome predictor other thing we use we should thank professor h graham um, from australia um, for developing the functional mobility scale and validating it initially it was used for cp but it's been validated in for children with spina bifida as well it measures their ambulatory function over three distances in the house in therapy and in the community that means at 5 50 and 500 meters and we routinely use it in our clinic where the walking ability is graded from 1 to 6 and over these three distances and we can compare it from one clinic to the next and we use it all the time in our clinic to predict and trend their ambulatory capacity 
So based on the mobility scale, the functional mobility scale and their neurologic level, we can then put these children into three groups essentially to determine or to plan treatment. Group one, usually have children with a high lumbar or a thoracic level myelomeningocele. They lack quadriceps function. That means L3 is not working, okay? So, and then low lumbar means usually L4, L3, L4, L5. They have quadriceps function, but they lack gluteus medius function sometimes, which is L5 and maximus, which is S1 function. And as you, as you notice here, the functional mobility scale is also predictive. In grade, in group one, the functional mobility score is usually one, one, and one for all those three distances. In the, in the second group, the low lumbar group, the functional mobility scale is three, three, and one. And the third group is the sacral group. Recently, Luciano Diaz has split the tip and added a fourth group and added a low sacral group, but you can combine them into group three. They usually have six, six, six on the functional mobility scale and they retain um, gas, they lack gastroc soleus function, but, but they retain quadriceps and gluteus medius function. So that's important. Okay, now what determines the ambulatory ability? It's usually determined by the neurologic level. It's also determined by the associated brain lesions we talked about earlier. And as the child gets older, it may also, Things like obesity may add into the muscle strength versus weight ratio, balance, plasticity, contractures, they all can contribute. Family support and what kind of medical treatment we see. Mohan, sir, I'll yes, stop sir. you for a minute. Uh, when you drift to the left, your voice is almost gone, sir. Okay. Can you hear me? I'll, I'll try not to. Okay. Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, you can yeah. start this slide again if possible. Yeah, so what determines ambulatory ability is the neurologic level, which is the most important uh, indicator. Other things could be associated brain and spinal cord lesions, which we already talked about. Other things are obesity, means the obesity negatively impacts the weight and the muscle strength ratio or the cross-sectional area of the muscle. Uh, and then... Um, balance, spasticity, contractures can also negatively impact the ability to walk. Um, family support is very important and um, medical treatment can also influence the ambulatory ability. So it not, it's not just the neurologic level. Now, if you look at the prognosis for walking, so like we said, if they have thoracic and higher lumbar myelos, they usually are not walkers in the long term. They may stand, they may make a few steps in the first few years of life, but they necessarily, by the age of four or five, they are not walking. The levels three, four, and five, especially level three, probably they may walk early on in the first decade, but they usually stop walking after as the weight increases and the muscle strength decreases uh, overall. And then in the lower lumbar levels, that's group two. Um, usually they continue to walk um, and about 80% continue to walk in the, in the long term. The sacral group, all of them remain community ambulators in the long term. So it's important to know that and you can predict this based on the neurologic level and plan treatment. Now, what do we do for group one? Usually we start with um, a HKFO, that means a hip, knee, ankle, foot orthosis at one year. If once the child has the ability to sit and is um, the physical therapist says that, you know, they have reasonable core strength, then we start off with the HKFO with a posterior walker or a, or a stander first. And then after that, maybe a reciprocating great gait orthosis. But the problem with these is we are doing less and less of this these days because the cost is very uh, very high of these prostheses because the RGO costs almost $5,000 in the United States and they hardly use it for a year or two and then they stop using them. So I think I, I, I use less and less of these uh, as time progresses. We do use a standard, a standing has been shown to be helpful. 
both for optimizing muscle, GI, respiratory, etc. function. In group two, which is the low lumbar group, we start with the KFO and a, and a standard or a walker. And as the walking progresses, as they gain strength, as the quadriceps strength improves, we then proceed to an AFO. Initially, we may use twister cables if they have rotational or transverse plane abnormalities. In group three or the sacral group, we usually start with an AFO, an articulated AFO, but as the child grows, we may uh, put them in SMOs or a UCBL as most of them remain community ambulators. So what orthopedic deformities can we see based on the neurologic level? In, in group one or the thoracic and high lumbar group, you can see a high prevalence of spine deformities like kyphosis, scoliosis, and, and ankle equinus contractures because everything is flail, ankle equinus results in, um, because, of, uh, like because of gravity. In the, in the mid lumbar, you can see hip dislocations, transverse plane abnormalities of the legs, um, club feet or, or foot deformities in general. In the low lumbar, myelomeningocele, you can see calcaneous deformity, especially if the ankle dorsiflexes are working and plantar flexes are not. They can also have plano valgus and other deformities. Um, the, the sacral group usually have intrinsic muscle weakness. This can result in cave varus foot deformity. So these are some of the deformities we see. Okay. Now, how does gait analysis help? Well, gait analysis help, helps in multiple ways. It helps in us being able to understand the problem in, more, in a more detailed fashion and learn from our mistakes. For example, we thought that relocating the hip in children who had a, like a mid lumbar or high lumbar myelomeningocele was important 30 years ago. And we did a lot of surgery like ileosoas transfers to the greater trochanter like Sherrod and mustard transfers. These have been not shown to be really helpful for function. So, the, so in that way, gait analysis has helped understand our mistakes. Also, uh, it helps in identifying the pathology that's causing the gait impairment. For example, especially in the transverse plane, it helps in surgical decision-making and a recent study from Connecticut Children's and Chicago Children's Hospital showed that in about 50% of cases, it changes the decision making that you did without gait analysis. Okay. Also, it's helpful in educating our residents. It, it's helpful for research and also for creating a center of excellence. So, for all those reasons, gait analysis is important. So, like I said, even a two dimensional gait analysis would be worthwhile considering, even if you don't have a 3D gait lab. Now, let's talk about hip issues. This is pretty controversial or used to be pretty controversial. It still is, I think. So you can see hip dislocations or subluxations in about 50% of these children um, as they grow into adulthood, or they could just have contractures, soft tissue contractures resulting in flexion contractures. Um, and both dislocation or dysplasia as well as contractures can impair um, their ability to walk um, to some extent. The contractures more so than hip dislocation or dysplasia. Recent studies from Chicago, from, from Dr. Luciano Diaz's hospital, as well as Connecticut Children's Hospital, they've followed, they published on it previously in about 2012 that the hip functional outcomes in the long term is not determined by relocation of the hip especially in the high lumbar and mid, -lum mid lumbar myelomeningocytes. And that's been borne out in the long-term study that they recently published in 2019, which where they followed about 30 patients of whom about 20 of them had dislocated hips either on one side or unilaterally or a subluxation and about 11 patients did not have 
uh, or had uh, located hips and they measured various lower extremity functional uh, outcome measures as well as range of motion and what they determined was um, in those who had relocation of the hips um, the range of motion was less and actually pain was more and actually hip relocation did not influence functional outcomes as measured by functional outcome measures validated functional outcome measures so the recommendation as of now is definitely l3 and above do not put the hip in as it does not affect function not only treat contractures if they Im impact on standing or walking ability and the lower lumbar also they are kind of leaning towards the same recommendation though we need more data to support that and definitely relocate the sacral ones or those who have good hip abductor function so that's where we stand currently so surgery only for hip flexion contractures or definitely in sacral ones and maybe in some selected cases of lower lumbar uh, myelomeningocytes knee flexion contracture is seen in about 30 50% of children usually common in group 1 and group 2 the cause is muscle imbalance between loss of quadriceps function and uh, some remaining hamstring function or spasticity or because of fracture malunion or positioning etc this usually begins to affect function when it's more than 20 or more degrees and if orthotic treatment fails then we may have to resort to serial casting anterior distal femoral hemiepiphysodesis and if it becomes more than 20 degrees dr ds has published on radical posterior release and these outcomes um, at least in his hand seem to be borne out though it's not been repeated in other centers uh, we need more evidence for this or distal femoral extension osteotomy but the osteotomy usually recurs especially when it's done in a younger child so more research is needed in this area uh, in terms of knee extension contractures it is less common um, usually it's congenital um like a knee dislocation as you see or hyperextension or subluxation usually serial casting quadriceps plasty or tenotomy of the patellar tendon is usually able to take care of most children uh, with this problem um as the children grow and they are ambulatory they may develop a pseudo valgus deformity of the knee as you see in this picture um in this boy this is because of excessive femoral antiversion and external tibial torsion and weak hip abductors resulting in a lateral trunk sway and some knee flexion contracture and hind foot valgus and this can result in the long term in osteoarthritis of the knee and pain this is more common in, in the lower lumbar and the sacral group sometimes and usually surgery is recommended in the older children to correct the torsional deformities and address the liver arm uh, problems in the foot as well and correct the knee flexion deformity um rotational deformities these could be persistent femoral antiversion because of fetal alignment or more commonly external tibial torsion because of muscle imbalance and the uh, as the weight bearing line shifts laterally when the child walks um because of the lateral trunk sway uh, resulting from weak hip abductors or as compensation for weak abductors sometimes you can also see internal tibial torsion because of club foot or its sequela usually in the younger children we can use twister cables uh, if it begins to impact on their uh, ability to walk for example tripping etc Um, if not then you wait until they are older to correct these usually osteotomy is recommended when the deformity is more than 20 or so degrees um coming to foot deformities these are the most common deformities you will see in this population almost 90% have foot deformities club foot is the commonest and we'll tackle each deformity at this point we can also see sometimes vertical talus calcaneus calcaneo cavus 
etc the aim of treatment is to provide a plantigrade supple braceable foot prevent um, a foot at risk and prevent decubitus ulcer because they also have an insensate foot in most cases um, usually resectional tendon releases work better than transverse like tendon transverse or tendon lengthening and osteotomies may be needed in older children now club foot usually we use the ponsetti method um, in the usual form however uh, the recurrence rate is much higher than in children with idiopathic club feet um, recently again dias's group has shown that an open resectional tendoachillis lengthening as opposed to a closed percutaneous tendoachillis tenotomy may reduce the recurrence rate but that still needs to be um, there needs to be more evidence and more research on this topic but definitely higher recurrence rate um sometimes if if the recurrence becomes um, obvious then we may do resectional release later on or some of them may need a, a talectomy if they are re really rigid in the older children um, vertical talus usually we use the reverse ponsetti method and then an open talonavicular reduction and pinning if necessary um and for really rigid cases we use a dorsal approach a calcaneus deformity usually seen like we talked about in the lower lumbar case because of imbalance between the ankle dorsal flexors which are working and plantar flexors which are not working as shown on this picture and uh, on this x ray the consequences are in the long term this can cause point heel weight bearing resulting in decubitus ulcers and osteomyelitis resulting in amputation etc so it's better to tackle this earlier on rather than later um again luciano diaz has published on this and he, he recommends resection of the ankle dorsal flexors resulting converting the foot to a flail ankle and foot and bracing the foot because previously they used to do p body transfers where all the ankle dorsi flexors were transferred to the heel but the problem is that uh, the gastroc soleus muscle is a very powerful muscle and is the main uh, generator power generator and it's very difficult to replace this function and even all the muscles all the tendons for example ehl edl tibant if you transfer them posteriorly even then the the strength is not enough to replace the last function of the gastroc soleus so usually in spite of that the long term outcomes of the p body transfer has not been very great so currently most people are following the resectional anterolateral release that dias um, has published on if you see the child later you may have to do a combination where the child has already has a deformity that's developed you may need to do, do uh, release soft tissue release in addition to uh, some deformities either a calcaneal uh, sliding osteotomy like a samelson osteotomy or a midfoot osteotomy uh, depending on where the deformity is sometimes um the calcaneal cavus it could be an anterior cavus because of weak um in the sacral group weak intrinsic muscles in the foot or it could be a posterior cavus in the lower lumbar group where um they lack um the plantar flexors of the ankle are not working um, again if we see it later it can cause foot deformities and usually we do a combination of tendon release and osteotomies if to convert it to a plantigrade foot plano valgus or ankle valgus ankle valgus can result because of a short fibula and muscle imbalance and um, and also wedging of the distal tibial epiphysis and there can be valgus in the hind foot as well and depending on where it is whether it's in the ankle or the hind foot it may require uh, you to address the hind foot as well as the ankle uh, for that spine deformities again seen in group 1 or the thoracic and high lumbar group uh, most of this group will develop deformities either kyphosis or scoliosis usually the onset is early 
in this child, you can see a scoliosis is developing. Uh, sometimes uh, they are associated with spinal cord lesions like a syrinx or a Chiari malformation. This can cause rapid progression or a diastem. So you need to rule these out. Um, sometimes, again, congenital birth defects of the spine, either failure of formation or segmentation can cause these defects. Uh, and they need to be treated if um, they begin to affect sitting balance. We already talked about the Chiari malformation, hydrocephalus, syringomyelia, and diastem, and tethered cord. These also usually dealt by the neurosurgeons, but we can come across these uh, when we're dealing with spine deformities or they can contribute to lower extremity deformity. So for example, if you see a deformity that was not there, develop and progress rapidly, especially on one side, and sometimes bilaterally, then you may want to think about uh, causes such as these in the spinal cord that could be resulting in that. And may want to get an MRI of the whole spine to uh, look into that more carefully. Usually, uh, you know, the scoliosis, again, um, less common in ambulatory children, more common in the non-ambulatory and higher levels. Um, onset early, usually progresses slowly. Non-operative treatment early. Surgery recommended once it gets bigger or begins to interfere with sitting balance. Surgery is still controversial because some systematic reviews uh, pu published by James Wright from Toronto have shown that you know, the quality of life is not necessarily improved because it makes like intermittent catheterization and uh, they need uh, trunk mobility for various activities of daily living is decreased. They may have, have a higher incidence of sacral decubitus ulcers following spinal correction and also high infection rate because of bowel and bladder incontinence. So you need to weigh this carefully with the multidisciplinary team and with the family and make a shared decision making before do, uh, treating these deformities. So sometimes we, we may use growing rods these days um, or fusionless spine surgery before lung growth is completed or before the age of 10 to buy time. And if posterior spinal fusion is not successful and sometimes it may be difficult because the posterior elements are lacking, you may not have a place to fuse these spines then you may need to do both anterior and posterior spine fusion. Uh, what about kyphosis? Uh, again, uh, if it becomes, uh, initially you do wheelchair modification like cutouts in the back of the seat of the wheelchair. Uh, and if, this, if they have problems with skin breakdown or sitting imbalance and things like that, um, then you may, need, you may need to do surgical treatment, which would be Kyphectomy, um, as shown in this picture. Things to consider are timing people have reported both doing it early on in life and later in life. Uh, and then if you transect the cord, you may interfere with CSF dynamics. So usually, and bladder function, so you don't do that these days. Try to preserve cord function. You, you may need to resect two or three vertebrae at the apex of the deformity and usually perform um, a posterior spinal fusion to restore sagittal plane balance. Um, and then usually you may need to involve a plastic surgeon because the skin on the posterior aspect of the spine, especially where the defect was closed, may not have a lot of mobility, especially after scoliosis surgery. Usually after kyphosis surgery, that's less common because you have when you shorten the spinal column, there's more skin and soft tissue available to close. It's not as much of a problem, but definitely a plastic surgical consultation is needed before you tackle that. Um, another problem we see in these children, they have uh, decreased bone density because of non-ambulatory status, because of endocrine issues, or because of metabolic uh, issues. And the prevalence increases as they grow older. Physiolysis, because they are insensate, they can have a Charcot joint and physiolysis may be common. And they may present with swelling, bruising like an infection, but sometimes it's just physiolysis. So the treatment depends on the functional level. 
in the, in the higher lumbar and thoracic levels, you treat it non-operatively as much as possible. In ambulatory children, you may need to treat it surgically because you don't want to immobilize them for a long time. And also cast treatment may be difficult because of the insensate skin. Now, coming to the skin issues, a lot of children as they grow older develop these uh, because they are insensate and they may have food deformities. Um, this can result in osteomyelitis or even amputation. So essentially it's very important that we prevent these from happening rather, rather than taking care of them once they happen. Um, education is better. Um, uh, educating the family as well as the child total contact casting if they do develop an ulcer like you do in a diabetic foot, uh, correcting the foot deformities may be necessary. Uh, very rarely, and you, you, you don't want to do this more often, um, is uh, they may require amputation to save the child's life. Um, and then last but not the least, the psychosocial issues, they may have decreased intelligence, decreased IQ, they may have learning difficulties, um, this can result in uh, you know, lower education and employment levels later on in life. Some of the predictors for psychosocial levels are similar to ambulatory risk factors. For example, high spinal level, shunted hydrocephalus, shunt complications, if they have seizures, um, obesity, et cetera. Um, and transition to adult care from pediatric care may be difficult if the child has good cognition and family support and you look for transition readiness, what, what that means is if they have a good knowledge of what the consequences of spina bifida are, how to care for themselves, and if they have good decision-making and self-advocacy skills, as well as a good family and medical support system, then they are likely to have a good transition into the adult system. Um, in terms of education and employment, if you look at the long-term outcomes at 40 and 50 years, only about 50% go to college as opposed to you know, more than two thirds in, in the typically developing children. Um, they are at risk for having um, less employment uh, as well as they continue to live with their parents. Um, they don't have any, they're li less likely to get married um, or have children, for example. And many of them, you know, even have difficulty driving, et cetera. So if you look at the adult consequences, this can, they, they can constitute a significant economic burden, um, like we already talked about. And many of them have musculoskeletal pain uh, in the long term, secondary to, you know, deformities or skin ulceration. And as they grow older, you know, the number of people who continue to walk decreases. Um, so, so the take home messages are spina bifida is the most common neural, open neural tube defect and results in permanent disability. Um, prevention is better than cure. Folic acid supplements both before and during pregnancy, especially in the first trimester. Identifying the neurologic level, both motor and sensory is key to predicting function and multidisciplinary team approach is essential. So I'm happy to take questions. So we all over the world should work towards redefining care for children with spina bifida uh, and reducing this economic burden uh, and preventing it from prevent it from happening. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you so much, uh, Mohan, for a comprehensive overview of uh, spina bifida. I think it's been a long time since I heard. I can't uh, hear you. Like this because usually we just tend to focus on the orthopedic problems and conveniently forget about everything else. So that's a common mistake that we make as orthopedic surgeons. It's very important because <clears throat> particularly in a place like India, the orthopedic problem is the most obvious. It is the most uh, visible problem. So they may not know about uh, other options. Like many of the spina bifida children that come to me, they have bladder problems, bowel problems. Uh, some of them have tethered cord or uh, undiagnosed hydrocephalus. And it's our responsibility as orthopedic surgeons to refer to refer them to uh, refer them onward to the relevant specialties. So we may be the only uh, carers that the parents are really in touch with. And 
they don't do the typical patient with spina bifida they don't do much reading up or they don't have google access and things like that so we have to act as uh, patient advocates and i think it's been very revealing to me as an orthopedic surgeon about the number of problems they have if i just open the um, discussion up to the panelists uh, hitesh could you just um, uh, enable your um, um, unmute yourself and if you could come online and ashish as well yes do we have any multidisciplinary clinics for spina bifida specifically in india that you are aware of because certainly in bangalore we don't have any such facilities do you know of any multidisciplinary clinics yeah the, the one of the pediatric surgeon from bombay had established the spina bifida group in india so he was very active on the this group the spina bifida association of india and uh, he is playing the lead role and 2018 he organized the international spina bifida conference including multidisciplinary neurosurgeon gastro surgeon pediatric surgeon orthopedic surgeon in delhi and i think uh, allarik has participated good i also went there in new delhi 2018 yeah i think the last two years they've started working on it yes so that's a, that's that's definitely a good sign um, yeah, yeah. can everyone see my screen i just want to uh, put up a few cases wadia children hospital in in wadia also we have we have a, a multidisciplinary clinic so that's good and we need more such multidisciplinary clinics in order to reduce the amount of disease burden and we should be we should try and start these clinics or team up with our uh, pediatric sub specialty colleagues to try and um, Um, you know bring things together in the in the in the same place similar to what we are doing with uh, cp perhaps uh, not just to not just to reduce the disease burden but also to improve the outcomes otherwise you will have a higher complication rate higher mortality because things don't get picked up early and they don't get dealt with early so i think that's very important uh, yeah giant one point actually the very important point like whenever the orthopedic surgeon sees the tethered cord then they will send it to neurosurgeon but if they both work in a team it would be good and ideal that when to intervene the timing of the intervention is crucial because many of times the neurosurgeon play a conservative role for the dealing with the tethered cord if it is not progressing so the team approach would be the good and ideal <clears throat> ashish comments yeah just taking back a little bit uh, many times we get many patients where something in the spine has been picked up in prenatal ultrasound and they are referred to us about decision making so how how do you tackle with that what what do well, you tell well how, how do you deal with this in the u in the in the in the us prenatal so cost. for example these days we have the fetal mri right so we have prenatal consults so they get the fetal mri ultrasound is done if they detect high afp levels ultrasound is done then everybody gets an antenatal ultrasound and then if if they detect abnormality they get a fetal mri <laughs> these days the fetal mri the last 3 4 years you know we get really good pictures and we have couple of radiologists dedicated to this and if they pick it up they can almost tell you exactly where is the <laughs> level so you you can determine the level for example the picture i showed you had at it at the sacral level so based on that you can predict like what is the function and also if it's picked up early on and if it's a very high level you can advise them about medical termination pregnancy as well depending on what the family wants you explain to them what are the pros and cons of continuing with pregnancy what you can expect what are the consequences of the defect and then let them make a shared decision making you know with the you know the perinatologist pediatrician as well as the family so that's what we try to do enable them empower them and then let them make the decision another important thing i wanted to ask you is what about prevention how much is that of it is followed is it, in india is fully cassette mandatory by the government for all antenatal for antenatal care certainly it's improving because we have asha workers uh, who are going to all the villages and trying to do their best but as you know uh, there are huge challenges with the population 
and you know regularly we hear stories from our obstetrician colleagues of uh, very young mothers you know who are probably 18 20 years of age um, the first time when they are antenatally checked their hemoglobin is 4 or 5 so you can imagine that even before they become pregnant they are significantly challenged physiologically and pregnancy poses an additional burden on their resources so it's a, it's a huge challenge but i think you know it's a, it's a much larger social and uh, political uh, it needs a lot of political uh, will to invest more in healthcare more for primary healthcare and more for social well being so i think it's going to take a long time before we see improvements of that nature so, so i would like to quote this uh, this saying like a, a pinch of prevention is better than a pound of cure so Absolutely. you make a you, you make a few paisa like a, a few pennies investment and then it'll it'll, it'll give you a lot of um you know a lot of benefits in the long term reduce burden to society and to the government in taking care of the children so i mean but has the has the pediatric orthopedic society of india along with the spina bifida association do you know if the government has passed a legislation to make it mandatory or anything like that for folic acid uh, i'm not sure i'll i, I can ask no, the other panelists no we don't i mean do, so. that's something that you, you you guys can do for sure if it's not been done already and even if it's been done maybe you know may put it out as a guideline in the posi like they need to have antenatal scan they need to have you know the two steps of prevention we talked about maybe making it more obvious like publicizing it sure so if we just move on to the cases can everyone see my screen jayant can i can i have one point on that please please yeah the the mohan you have said about that is uh, the 60 to 70% genetic cause and 30 to 40% of the environmental cause like the folic acid deficiency uh, it would be the good idea that to have the fortification of the folic acid like the prevention of goiter we did for the iron the yeah. is it is it a good idea to have the push the government to use about the fortification of folic acid to prevent some, such a big effect yes because that, that's because that's what the united states has done in 1996 they passed the legislation F FDA approved it, and then they started fortifying the prenatal vitamins with with folic acid. And since then, they have seen a, like I said, a drastic reduction. So I think if the Indian government should pass this legislation, if it's not already been passed, I'm okay. not sure. So I think POSI uh, should make a lead and use the for the fortification <clears throat> to the government. I guess that would be good. Yes, oh. multiple randomized control trials and systematic reviews are available. So you'll get enough evidence to support if the government wants to do that. That would be one, one, one small step you can take in preventing this. Uh, like I said, a pinch of prevention would be worth a lot of things. And it, it would not be too much work for you to advocate for this. So we have about so, 15 minutes left. Yeah, yeah. So Jane, if we can just, just move to the cases. All right. So yeah, Taral is eager to where are you? So just Here one you quick, out. very, very quick point is uh, we have Spina Bifida Foundation who's been working on that. The problem is that 95% of households in India, they do chakki kata, meaning they will buy wheat and then uh, grind the wheat into atta and have. And hence, fortification will doesn't work very well. The reason is people don't buy ready-made atta. And because we don't buy so much ready-made food, the fortification will not work very well. And we need to have some other methods to provide folic acid to genetically modify the wheat so it it, it becomes high in folic acid content oh, no, no, not possible <laughs> anyway so moving on can everyone see my screen yeah yeah so this is a four-year-old boy and they came to me uh, he has a sacral spina bifida uh, independent walker uh, for the last uh, previous 12 months he progressively developed a foot deformity. Uh, we tried to brace it, but he developed pressure sores because he has an insensate foot. And this is his video.
So it looks like he has a high stepage gait on the right side with a plano valgus foot and an external foot progression angle. So it seems like he has a flail ankle on that right side. Yeah. So he's got a patchy hypoesthesia of both feet, um, sensory and motor problems. So we have tried bracing it and we are no longer able to brace it. So it's a four-year-old boy, quite a severe foot deformity with functional problems. So Mohan, how would you approach uh, this case? The same principles, you need to examine the child to determine what is the cause. Is it myelomeningocele or is it a lipomeningocele? Is it a close? Oh, it's because a, it seems like one side is more affected than the other side, asymmetric. Yeah. So it was an open spina bifida, which has been closed at birth. Um, and then for the first three years, he was okay. And in the, in the last 12 months, he has developed this deformity. Mm -hmm. So what's his neurologic level? Uh, his neuro, so he's a, uh, he's a sacral, he's a sacral level uh, spina bifida. I don't think he's sacral because he, he has a high step edge gait. That means he doesn't have ankle dorsiflexors. So that would be no L5 there on that side. Because as you can see here, if you put that video again on the right yeah, side. Some, some there, there might be, you know, or you can call him a low lumbar sort of L5, S1, that sort of thing. But he has got good quadriceps. Yeah, I mean, on the left side, he may be low sacral, but on the right side, definitely he's higher. Uh, he's probably L4 level uh, yeah. or maybe higher because L4 means the T-band is should be working. I don't see that the T-band is working there. He mainly has an equinus contracture because of gravity and that's causing the midfoot break. And he's got external tibial torsion there because of the hip abductor weakness. And that's causing external tibial torsion and plano valgus foot. And, and that's why, and also he has decreased sensation. That's why he's developing a, a pressure sore there. Okay. So uh, in terms of how you would approach the uh, foot deformity? Well, non-operative treatment first, because if the it's aim been, is to provide him... Right. So um, we, we braced him with, a, with, a, with an AFO and he started to develop pressure sores. So that's, that is the situation now. Yeah. So what degree of contraction does he have in his ankle? No, no, there's, there's no contracture. It's a, it's a supple flail foot. It's a supple okay. flail foot. All right. Well, in order to prevent the brazing, you need to control the deformity and address. So you need to do a multi-segmental evaluation of the foot and ankle. So he needs x-rays, weight-bearing x-rays of his foot, as well as of his ankle. He could have valgus coming from the ankle as well as from the hind foot. Uh, and he has a plano valgus and he has external tibial torsion. So you need to address all those things. So do you have any x-rays? Um, I don't have any uh, pre-op x-rays, but he doesn't have ankle valgus. He, we, we have done a, uh, uh, an ankle x-ray. There's no valgus in the ankle. Um, it's primarily a foot deformity uh, and it's completely flexible. Uh, it's only four years. Um, it's a completely flexible deformity. So, uh, so I think the aim is to provide him with a plantigrade, but brazable foot. Stable, so, yeah. so the hind foot valgus, you may need to correct with an subtalar fusion or like an extra articular fusion, or like a grease green procedure or one of those things. Um, I don't know, like so that's right? exactly what we did mm -hmm. because it's a very young child. Uh, so we did a grease green extra articular arthrodesis. Um, but he may he may also have some. You may uncover some forefoot supination when you correct the hind foot valgus. Yeah, uh, thankfully he didn't have much uh, forefoot supination because this deformity has been only going on for about uh, twelve months now. Uh, okay. So that is about six months uh, post op. Um, how you did you address the How did you address the external external tibial torsion? Ah, I did not touch it because he's four years old. So I okay. wanted to see. Um, whether correction of the foot deformity alone would be sufficient. And if we brace him um, and he's under follow-up now for about four years and he's doing, he's doing very well. And you can see um, that the uh, dry subtalar fusion has worked. I also use a, a screw to protect uh, the, the subtalar fusion on the lateral side. So I put a Denison Fulford uh, screw from the neck of the talus down to the calcaneum. 
Uh, do you do uh, something similar or would you, is, is your technique any different? It depends on what the main problem is. If the hind foot valgus is the predominant deformity, you can do a subtalar fusion. But I mean, the key is the telonavicular joint because 80% of movement in the hind foot is dictated by the telonavicular joint. It's called as the acetabulum pedis. So yeah. in my hands, if there isn't too much hind foot valgus, I usually do a telonavicular fusion and the lateral column, like a calcaneo cuboid distraction arthrodesis. Um, but um, but if the hind foot valgus is a predominant issue, then then you know you can do a subtalar fusion. Uh, so the, uh, the I, I just brought up this case because it's the the options are much better. We have more number of options in the older child, but in yes. a young child who has a uh, unbraceable foot, the options are quite limited. And I think something like an extra articular fusion of the subtalar joint is quite a uh, uh, a useful technique at this age. So you're not burning any bridges. Um, I agree. You still go back. Hitesh, Hitesh, your comments, have you employed similar techniques? Yeah, generally after the, uh, whenever the child with the spina bifida has got the sensory problem, I avoid fusing the uh, joints or the foot, ankle and foot joints anytime in there. Previously, we used to do with the uh, Grice and Grues and Denison and Fout for both for the fusion. But now I prefer more about the conservative treatment in form of the casting, bracing, modification of the bracing in very young child like this. And the later we can do about correction with the osteotomy rather than fusing in the spina bifida, basically. Why, why don't you use fusion in spina bifida? Uh, because if there is a the, the good paper article is there, Whenever there is a deform, insensate, and the stiff foot, the chances of the ulceration in foot is more than 90%. If it is supple and not mobile, plus planticate foot, the chances of the ulceration is zero. And if it is in between, then the chances of the ulceration would be around 50 to 60%. And that is the reason I avoid the fusing the ankle and the subtalar joint of telonavicular, if it is possible, I'm not telling this all 100%, but if it is possible, the plantricate supple foot is much better than stiff and deformed foot. So this, this boy also had a tethered cord. Uh, he had a tethered cord, but the neurosurgeons uh, looked at the case closely and they said that we are not going to intervene, but he actually had a tethered low-lying cord. So I think it's important to do an MRI uh, in all children who come around four, five, six years with a progressive foot deformity, all of them should have a spine MRI and uh, ideally a neurosurgical consult. Would you would, would all the panelists agree with that? So I think sometimes the, the neurosurgical detethering may actually reverse the deformity sometimes. Yeah. So, but in all cases, I think we should get a MRI and of the spine uh, in these cases. So my next case is another common deformity. This is a 13 year old girl with a calcaneo cavus uh, foot deformity. She had a non 